Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. I'm here this week with my co-host, uh, Dr. Clay Zimmerman, and we are at the poultry science meetings in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And our guest this evening is uh, Andy Vance, who is the newly minted executive director of the PSA. Andy, welcome to the Real Science Exchange. Thanks, Scott. I'm glad to finally get in the pub. I've been a fan of the podcast for well, since its inception, really. I remember when you and I were talking about this before we did, it was a real before thing. It became a thing. So finally yeah. having the chance to come in and, and sit down over a, a pint, so to speak. Uh, not literally in this case, unfortunately, but we'll get one together after the recording's over. Exactly. It's, it's a treat. I appreciate you I'm being here. You were one of my uh, inspirations, so Andy, because you know you've been involved in podcasting and radio. So uh, uh, and and you did some of those those little shorts for us. So right. uh, anyway, Andy, want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, the Poultry Science Association. What, what's your mission uh, for the for the association? To sum it up really simply, the the reason we have a poultry science association is to advance poultry science worldwide. And and you'll notice I didn't say to advance the poultry science association worldwide. It's it's about the science, uh, not the organization. So our goal, whether it's at this meeting, whether it's at our academic journals that we publish, whether it's other events that we hold, we have uh, an international scientific meeting every couple of years in Brazil. It's all about advancing the science. Uh, that takes a lot of forms. As I, as I mentioned, we publish trade journals, uh, publish academic journals rather, so we can get the research out there. You know, it's happening at universities, it's happening at companies, it's happening all over the world, providing a forum where researchers can publish their work. Uh, it happens in the form of these meetings where we get together and we present that research facilitate discussions among professionals and practitioners, you know, to be able to generate ideas, make connections, form collaborations that will result in, in future research. And you know, might be Dr. Zimmerman saying, hey, you know, I've been thinking about this and, and, and Dr. So-and-so says, yeah, me too. And maybe they collaborate on that because of hallway talk at this kind of meeting. Yeah. Uh, but it's also about developing, you know, that next generation of researchers. We have a great number of students here. You'll, you'll have a chance to talk with some of them during your conversations. And, and, and helping them figure out, you know, how can they become some of the, the, the leading researchers and experts in the field. So those are all things that we do at the association, but it's all about advancing the science and, and helping the professionals who are doing the research, doing the work, doing the extension, doing the education, how to help them do that more effectively around the world. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the numbers for this specific uh, conference here in Philadelphia, uh, papers, right. attendees, that kind of thing? We're really excited. This year represented a, a more than 15% increase year over year in attendees. You'll nice. recall, think about a year ago, we were all kind of just coming back from COVID and can we get out and be together? And we were also happy just to be able to, to meet in the real world yeah. again. And so we had a, a wonderful meeting in San Antonio Fast forward a year here in Philadelphia, we've had a, an almost 15%, maybe now by the time walk-in registrations are done, maybe closer to a 20% increase. We'll, we'll have more than 1,150 um, attendees here at the meeting, which wow. is fantastic. And as I mentioned, that covers you know, students, uh, academic professionals, industry professionals, a really great mix of people involved in poultry science. In terms of the presentations, our scientific program was huge this year. I, I think this may have been our biggest scientific program ever. We had 13 symposia over the course of the four days, including a full day workshop on myopathies and broilers. Um, really want to want to shout out Shai Barbet from uh, Canada who put together the three different symposia working on some of the, the meat processing um, aspects of poultry production. We have, uh, as I mentioned, 13 symposia in total covering everything from our informal nutrition conference, uh, feed additives, looking at you know, feed ingredient composition if we're importing you know, soybeans from somewhere. It's just a really interesting mix of, because again, we cover all different disciplines within the broader scientific area of, of poultry. So nutrition, muscle biology, you know, uh, avian pathology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The biggest part of our program outside those symposia uh, are the presentations of abstracts and posters. So anyone has, has been to a scientific meeting, the presentation of those research abstracts and posters is always a hallmark. We have uh, more than 510, like 515 different abstracts presented between oral presentations and almost 200 of those are posters. So really great opportunity for both professionals and students 
to get their work out there, to be able to present it, have some give and take and some dialogue, but absolutely massive scientific program this year. And, and we're really tickled that people um, value the brand, I guess, if you will, value the credibility would be the better way to say it, that Poultry Science Association has that they wanna present their research here. There are a lot of different places you can present research these days, a lot of different places you can publish research these days. We continue to have the highest rated journal uh, by Impact Factor. Our Impact Factor went up again this year, so we're now the number four journal among all journals in the animal science and zoology arena, um, and, and certainly the top rated among um, any journals that are in the poultry space out there. So we're really proud of that credibility, and that's why you see those numbers continue to rise, because people it's a feather in their cap on their CVs and so on and so forth that they could present at this particular meeting or publish in these journals. So yeah. really proud of that. So as a, the new executive director, I'm asking you a two part question. Yeah. First one is, you know, what, what do you see the future? Where do you kind of want to move the organization uh, going forward? And then the second part of that question, let's talk a little bit about next year and where the meeting's going to be and maybe some things that we'll see different. Yeah, appreciate that. We'll start with the vision question because that's really um, one of my predecessors, Dr. Steve Koenig, who was, who was executive director uh, here for several years, great, great fellow himself, and I, I'm a layman, Steve, right? I come, with Steve. You, you know, Steve. So I come from, you know, the media um, background. I was a farm radio broadcaster, wrote for many years at Feedstuffs, where you and I became great friends, uh, and, and worked with our marketing and advertising partners at Feedstuffs for a long, long time. And so when I came into this role, Dr. Koenig said to me, he said, "Yeah, what, what you have to remember is that you were the only person, staff or board, who was tasked with." looking ahead, down the road, and charting the course. What's the vision for the organization? Because, you know, board members, like they they are our leaders. They're really the ones who set the agenda. Mm. Now, when you become a, a member of the board of directors, especially when you get in the officer line and become president, you know, that is your organization. But you're president of the organization, you're on the board for a, a short period of time, you know? four years maybe in the officer line. You've been on the board maybe seven, eight years in total, something along those lines. So that's a really short period of time. So the professional staff, our job is not only to execute the agenda that the board sets out, but as executive director, I'm really doing what you just asked, to look down the road, where where are we going? So some of that starts with understanding what are the challenges and opportunities that scientists are facing? So one, uh, I've mentioned it several times, our, our trade journals, right? So making sure that we're providing a vehicle where our researchers continue to publish, can continue to publish their work. So that means, you know, protecting the integrity of the journal, making sure there's a lot of journals out there these days, uh, not just in the poultry space, but I mean, just more generally, who play, can we say fast and loose, maybe with some of the rigors of the peer review process. Um, and, and, this, and, and, the, and by the way, the journals, aren't the only ones who bear culpability for this. I would challenge you know, our academic partners out there that this mindset of the publisher perish, um, it's always been that way. But in this day and age, it's all about the numbers, right? So some of our, our faculty members are really under a lot of pressure to just publish, 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 publish. Well, you know what? Sometimes it's better to pull back a little bit, be a little bit more thoughtful and, and not try to turn out 100 papers a year to do better, stronger research by publishing the best work and so on and so forth. So I, I would say in general, making sure that we're continuing to provide a rigorous, credible, respectable journal of record. We do that, we'll continue to do that. So a lot of my work is focusing on how do we protect that? How do we, how do we continue to provide the best in class publishing opportunity for uh, not only our members because Two thirds of the people who publish in our journals are not members. They're, they're researchers who are in the space, but aren't necessarily members. Yeah, it surprised me too. So that's, that's one thing. Another one is our, our meetings and looking and saying, how do we continue to improve this event? How do we continue to improve? We every two years, we do a Latin America scientific conference in Brazil. So how do I continue to grow that uh, as, as a place for our South American colleagues to be able to publish, um, uh, not to publish, but to present? We're looking at expanding into the Asia Pacific region, you know, with more than 50% of our submissions to our journals now coming from China specifically, but the Asia Pacific rim more generally, are we providing opportunities for those authors, for those graduate students, for those faculty members, for those industry folks who are working in China, Thailand, Vietnam, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Are they able to access the work that we're doing here okay, let's take it to them and, and foster those collaborations. How can we get 
uh, a Clay Zimmerman working with colleagues in, in China, in Korea, in Thailand. Well, if we can provide that hallway talk at a Asia Pacific conference. So we're looking at how can we do that? Mm -hmm. so what will that look like? So my hope is in two, three, four years that we're talking about oh. our, our first Asia Pacific conference. We're actually working right now with our partners at the World Poultry Science Association, the USA and Canada branch, on helping them organize the World's Poultry Congress in Toronto in 2026. So we'll be hosting our meeting in conjunction with the World Poultry Congress in that year in Toronto. So that's a, a big one that occupies some of our time. So just looking at that part of the business, we're looking at a partnership with the American Association of Avian Pathologists to co-host a meeting in 2027 collaboration, right? It's not just about us. It's about advancing the whole poultry science community. Yeah. And so that's with partner organizations and so on and so forth. So, so that's my vision is looking at what is our mission we talked about earlier, advancing poultry science worldwide, and how do we move the chess pieces on the board in such a way that we can provide the scientific community with the resources to get, to get the job done. Some of that also includes growing our um, financial assets. So our foundation, for example, our board of directors just this week voted to endow a $500,000 fund at the PSA Foundation specifically to support our student travel awards. So we have more than 20 students this meeting who would get a travel reimbursement award from PSA that will help defray their costs of traveling to this meeting. Nice. So we looked and said, that's a really um, important thing. So we want the students to be supported. How, how do we keep that going in perpetuity? So the board looked at our financial assets and said, you know what, this is something we want to make sure that those awards continue to be paid out in perpetuity. So we created this half million dollar endowment at the foundation yeah, nice. just to support that program. So some of those kind of things come into the mix as well. So that's wow. all part of the, the portfolio, yeah, if you will. Plan. Yeah. Now, your second question was about next year. So yep. I didn't remember that two-part <laughs> question. Next year, um, excited to take this meeting. You know, we've been on the East Coast here. We try to move around the country as we can to, again, provide different opportunities for folks. We're going to be in Louisville, Kentucky. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to the Bluegrass State. We're going to be enjoying some bourbon and bluegrass. Nice. Be enjoying, uh, you know, all of the hospitality that a great state. As a proud Kentucky colonel myself, I'm I'm excited to um, be able to, to bring folks to Louisville. This meeting's been in Louisville a number of different times over the okay. years. and. This particular um, meeting, actually, we're going back to Louisville because we were supposed to be there during COVID. Mm -hmm. And so we had some obligations okay. to fulfill to uh, the hotel and the facilities there where we had signed contracts. So we're going back to Louisville to fulfill those obligations, which is which is only right. Yeah. And so we're looking forward to that. But we're trying to, um, as a staff, come up with some ways to, to spice it up a little bit, you know, because we've been to Louisville a number of times in the past. And so our members, you know, we, we want to find something new, just like research. We want to find something novel that we haven't done before yet. So we're, we're working on that. I mean, literally, as soon as we close the books on this meeting. Yeah. Stay tuned then, huh? The, we're laser focused on the next meeting. Well, and it's, you know, a lot of what we do year to year, um, it, there's consistency. It's, it's about the scientific program. Ultimately, that's the number one thing. But one of the things I'm focused on is how do we provide some opportunities for for fun and fellowship for the members? Because it's not we provide, you know, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. scientific programming four days straight. That's a lot of science, Clay. Yes, it is. So how do we make sure that when it's time to, you know, put the notebook away, that we can continue to, to, to develop relationships and the friendships that I've seen among the members of this community, uh, just they warm my heart. Yeah. It, it, there are some really lasting friendships that are built among these professionals, academia, industry uh, alike, and they, they form at these meetings. So we're gonna provide a lot of opportunities for that. So the program uh, itself is our centerpiece, yeah. but I think folks will be really pleased with some of the things we're gonna do together on the, the fun and fellowship side of a trip to Louisville be in Raleigh, North Carolina in 2025. We'll be in Toronto, as I mentioned, for the World Poultry Congress in 26. And we'll be in Fort Worth, Texas in 2027, along with the uh, avian pathologist. So we're very excited about those meetings. Be in Iguazu Falls in Brazil next October for our Latin America Science meeting. We've, huh. uh, we're have we gonna return to that resort, which is right on the waterfalls at Iguazu Falls, uh, the devil's throat, they call one of those waterfalls. So <laughs> if you've never been to our Brazilian conference, our Latin America scientific meeting, Put that on your calendar next week. I want to say October 10th through the 12th, 2024. 
and we'd love to have you well, both in the whole podcast down there. We might. I think we it's might. a great idea. Let's take the show on the road, fellas. A Brazilian barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I love I'm about thinking, Brazil, and it's meat, yeah. meat, 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 meat. Yeah. I was thinking of having a caprinha or two. <laughs> One of the best parts about my first trip to Brazil, I'd never heard of the caprinha. Yeah. I have a bottle of cachaça on my sideboard at home, uh, just waiting for a cup of Very nice. Yeah. Of it. Yes, so, it is. So, are there are there are there host universities involved with the meetings? Or yeah, not? this is a really interesting question, and one of the things I find fascinating is the history of the Poultry Science Association. So, we found as we were going through some things in the office the other day, a picture from 1950, someone had sent us. And the Poultry Science Association, it was a group picture of everyone who attended. You know, they're kind of like out sitting on the lawn, like on the hill. It reminded me of my FFA camp pic from when I was, you know, in school. They put all the campers out on the hill and took the picture. So they were at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, and, and up until, I'll say maybe you know, 98, 2000, uh, that, that, you know, turn of the century sort of thing, these meetings were held on university campuses. Yeah. And so universities, departments would, would bid to host. Um, you know, we might have been in Athens at the University of Georgia and you're staying in a dorm and you're having the sessions, you know, in university classroom buildings. Yeah. It's hard to do that today. Right. One, the organization has outgrown that model in terms of the number of attendees. You know, I was telling you earlier, we have 1,100 people registered for this meeting, 1,150 people registered. Tell me which university campus is eager to host 1,150 scientists for a week. And, and can have the facilities to do it. Now, the flip side of this is tell me how many of your colleagues want to stay in a, a dorm, yeah, dorm on yeah. campus, <laughs> right. you know? Okay. We're staying at the Philadelphia Marriott downtown. I'm in a very nice hotel room <laughs> with wonderful amenities and fantastic food, you know? So it's our expectations of a conference have changed a lot. Yeah. So I hear wonderful stories about, you remember that time we were at Texas A&M and we had the bar, part of the reason that we have a barbecue as our centerpiece social event during this conference is because it was on campus for those many years. So you yeah. might have block and bridal, saddle and sorrel, whatever out, yeah. you know, right. cooking dinner for people. And that was the big, it was a literal barbecue. Yeah. Uh, now it's, you know, we're going to be at a, the National Constitution Center and it's going to be you know, catered in, but we're still having a barbecue. But it goes back to those days when right. these meetings were held on university campuses all across the country. Yeah. Yeah. Andy, uh, during our conversations, you've mentioned uh, science is at the center of this whole thing. Absolutely. One of the things that we're going to try to accomplish uh, this week is to kind of showcase some of the science that's being presented here. Uh, Clay and his team picked out, I think it's about 12 uh, posters and presentations that uh, that we're going to feature in in a in actually a two-part uh, series podcast. Uh, we're going to break it break them into two. But Clay, can you kind of give us an idea of some uh, a flavor of, of some of the presentations we're going to hear about and, and how did you and your team go about picking just 12 out of the the many uh, available to you yeah so you know we went through the whole program the program book and and you know we tried to pick uh certainly topics that would be of interest to the audience yeah a uh, broad range of topics um of course you know we 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 looked at the abstract, so we're looking. We're look. We're looking for a mix of good science, good topics, and in a lot of cases, we really try to highlight the graduate students too. Yeah. Very impressive young people that are that are getting into the industry now. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I would say that dovetails what I hear from attendees because, you know. As somebody who's not a professional scientist, I always say, I look at that abstract book and there's 500 and some presentations here. How do you decide what you go and, and right. sit and listen to and watch? Where do you, you know, you, you could watch a presentation, uh, say from 5, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., four days straight. That's a lot of science. And so I ask some of those questions and they, they talk about, of course, you know, so what's your area of academic interest or your industry interest? If you're a nutritionist, okay, we've narrowed the field a little bit, but what you describe really mirrors, okay, maybe this is something new and novel that I haven't seen before, so I'm intrigued, or hey, here's a student I've been really impressed with. Maybe I've read some of their, their publications or some of their previous abstracts, so I wanna go and, and hear that particular speaker. It's a really interesting blend, too, because yeah. you have the grad students who are presenting alongside uh, you know, the, the uh, longer tenured you know, faculty members and or industry professionals. So I love that mix, too, that you have sort of our professional members presenting you know, same day and time, so to speak, as the students, and getting to see that that collaboration. But that's a your your approach mirrors, I think, what our average attendee does when they come in the door. Say, where am I? 
where am I going to go and spend my day? Yeah. I really like how you do the posters here. They're up all week. Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's very, really good interaction. Yeah. I, I really, really and enjoy how that is. And with the reception that they have here, there's a yeah. lot of activity taking place there over there. So that, I think that's well done as well. It's the first time I've attended. I've really, you know, I'm really looking forward to this. We, we tried to design it in such a way that, you know, you think about this is the economist and so my graduate studies were in agricultural economics not not poultry science or any of the animal animal science disciplines people respond to incentives so those poster presenters great research you yeah know? and so how do we make sure that that research is seen so put some beer in a reception <laughs> yeah. in the poster hall yes i can guarantee you scientists are going to show up yeah you know? have a have a reception there same thing why we co-locate in our exhibit hall. So for our sponsors who financially support and make this meeting possible, I want to make sure that they're there alongside those poster presenters. So as people are coming in to be exposed to that research, they have a chance to interact with experts like you and Malcolm who have been part of this meeting. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you for your uh, corporate support of helping us advance the science, help us, uh, you know, fulfill that mission. But we try to, you know, make it such a way. The worst thing I could imagine would be being a poster presenter and, you know, having a poster up and nobody coming to talk to me about it. Right. Yeah. You know, and so we, we really want to design our meeting in such a way that we give our scientists every opportunity to present their work. Yeah. Andy, this has been a real treat. I want to thank you for joining us here at the Real Science Exchange. I've enjoyed it. I can Enjoy check this off my bucket list. This was uh, something I've been looking for. You and I have been talking about getting yeah, together on a podcast for a couple of years. Let's not make this be the last No, one. absolutely not. All right. Thank Sounds you. Sounds good. Thank you, my friend. Welcome to the next generation in chelated minerals. Introducing new Keisher Plus amino acid chelated minerals from Balchem. Keisher Plus delivers a higher concentration of mineral with a superior amino acid profile. The higher mineral content adds formulation flexibility, opening up space in the ration, and also reduces the carbon footprint. The superior amino acid profile delivers 28% protein from microbial biomass and reduces the amount of supplemental lysine needed in the ration. The Keisher Plus line also offers a granulated form for improved handling characteristics and reduced dust. Visit Balchem.com to see how new Keisher Plus can deliver the added benefits you need to improve performance and reduce manufacturing hurdles. Welcome back to the uh, poultry science meetings here in Philadelphia. My co-host for this session is going to be Tom Powell. Tom is the director of Monogastrics for Balchem Corporation. Tom, I see you brought a guest with you to the pub tonight. Would you mind uh, giving him an introduction? You bet, Scott. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. John Halley with us. Uh, I've known John for a number of years. He's uh, held many important roles uh, in the industry. Uh, but he's here this week uh, to present some uh, information uh, to the group. So we'll let him talk a little bit about uh, what he's presenting this week. Yeah, I understand you have a presentation. Is that tomorrow? Uh, uh, it's on Wednesday. On Wednesday? Okay, yes. very well. Why don't you kind of give us uh, just kind of an outline of what we're going to be presenting? Okay. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is I, I spent some time and I called a lot of colleagues in the industry, both nutritionists, live production people, and just ask them questions about how they handle data, uh, how they were handling it going forward, and were the companies uh, digitalizing themselves, or, or were they just going to stay with what they were doing? And uh, so, got a lot of a lot of good responses from these guys, and and so part of what I'll talk about is uh, is how data flows through our our poultry companies as far as the nutritionist sees it today. And, uh, and then where we may be going in the future. And then probably I'll give a little bit of kind of, this is, this is what I think it could be and how it could help. So when you kind of took a look at that history, how far back did you look? Uh, well, I've got some slides in there from early 1900s. But, okay. uh, All right. <laughs> but uh, I think 
you know, we, we would probably all agree that in the, in the early days of the poultry industry, there really wasn't much data being looked at and, and uh, people were, it was a pretty basic business of, you know, a, a small grower would grow 50 birds and I'll come get what I need. I'm going to hand process them and put them on a truck, cover them with ice, and drive them to the nearest city. Yeah. And so, so there wasn't any any real data analysis going on. By the time I got in the industry in the early 1980s, we had some industry reporting services that were collecting data and feeding it back to companies. Uh, nutritionists are analyzing feed. Uh, and uh, analyzing ingredients coming into the feed mill, so we're starting to starting to get more data at that point in time, and and from there, uh, it really though, that part of the data handling really hasn't changed much, to be honest. And uh, and now now that we're starting to get into the digital age, uh, we're starting to see some some more exciting things that I think will really be be helpful. Yeah, why don't you talk a little bit about that, right? We've got so many more sensors now. We've got big data, lots of things. And, and then where do you see it going? Yeah, the, you know, and I, I'll mention this during the, during the talk, but uh, we, in the poultry industry, there's always this kind of um, understanding that we have tons of data. We have all this data, but we really don't. And uh, we typically at a complex level, you're going to get one set of data every week and it, and you're going to get one feed conversion one body weight it's, so it's not like you have a lot of data that you can really look at and do anything with and then typically this data is is coming at you behind the behind the curve so so the birds are gone process and then you see the data of what what happened so what i see coming is that with with sensors and and uh and uh, apps uh, that people can build themselves on their phones or on computers, that we're gonna start seeing more real-time information that hopefully will allow somebody to make a, a decision that can, that can affect those birds before they ever go to process. Yeah. So would you say that's one of the biggest gaps we have today is having real-time data and not just historical data? I think so, I think so. I mean, I guess we need the historical, uh, you know, we, we typically uh, call that descriptive data because it really just describes what happened. And, uh, but to me, the other side where we need to go is we need to have predictive data. We need to be able to predict what's going to happen yeah. going forward so that we're not always just looking back, you know, trying to, trying to drive the car looking in the rearview mirror. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> I was going to ask, John, what, and I know in the past you've, you've you and I have discussed what the possibilities are for feed conversion and things like that on on the poultry side, and I, I'm assuming this is sort of going that direction where we were better able to uh, to formulate the ration. But what what's possible? I, you know. Well, I mean that's a good question, and and the longer that I've worked in the industry, I've realized that uh, that. Most of most of what is what is available is genetic. You know, having worked for a couple of genetics companies, you realize that that you know you can't go below, beyond whatever the genetics will allow. Right. Um, but you can certainly keep them from reaching that genetic potential. And I think that's where all these sensors and and uh, uh, these devices are going to really help us because we're going to start to understand all these other factors that are robbing us of performance and yield and, and these things. And then we can start to get them under control at the right time during the grow up. John, I'm really looking forward to uh, listening to your presentation here on Wednesday. Appreciate it. Uh, and appreciate you stopping uh, by and spending some time with us you here bet. this afternoon. You bet. Enjoyed it. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. pleasure meeting you as well. Good to see you, Tom. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tom. So, Clay, you had a lot of uh, abstracts to choose from. Um, why did you pick this one? And then, can you introduce our guest for us? Yeah, so so we we picked this one because it was a very interesting uh, nutritional model to look at uh, potential um, ways to look at uh, analyzing uh, the effects of feed additives. Interesting. In the diet. Yeah. 
And uh, so, our, so our guest today is Addison Elsner from Texas A&M University. Well, sir. Welcome, Addison. So I guess you did a poster over there. I did. Uh, yeah, so tell us a bit about the poster. What was the objective, what we were trying to find out? Yeah, so basically our objective was to try to find a, or use a different basil diet than our traditional corn and soy. We wanted to go ahead and stress out those birds with high inclusions of other cereal grains. We wanted to just kind of get a preliminary model of where we could take cereal diets and how they would affect intestinal health, performance, animal welfare, things of that nature, before we then add feed additives and enzymes and how those will work in the future. Oh, interesting. Now, what kind of different feed additives? You mentioned enzymes. Were there other classes of uh, additives as well? So we didn't add any additives. That is our a uh, futuristic model. We wanted to just see on our basal diet, the different formulations, how they would react. And we, in our, if you were to show you my poster in our variable diet, we went ahead and did like a high inclusion of barley at like a 10% uh, to stress out those birds. Uh, we did see what you would get from stressing those birds out using a high percentage of another cereal grain. And that's a lot of fecal shedding. But in the future, we would like to see if those feed additives were to work in a alternative diet, basal diet, or if it would also help mitigate that as well. So what other ingredients did you use in that, that diet to stress the birds? So we had in our variable diet, a two-phase diet. In the starter, we used a sorghum, also a meat bro bone meal to increase the protein amount in there. And then in our grower phase, we went ahead and switched it over to using corn and a 10% of barley. So, Addison, where are you in your scholastic journey there at Texas a &M? So, I am in the middle of it all. I graduated from my undergrad in May, and I start my PhD under Dr. Dr. McElroy in the fall. Okay. Yes, and what's your plans? What's the future look like? What do you want to do with that degree? So, my plans are I start starting my PhD in the fall, but I did just recently have my first trial in the spring with a company. So, I'm looking on continuing some trials with them as well, and then just getting out of grad school basically and then eventually hopefully being an, a good nutritionist okay yes, sir. In the industry. yes sir very well well i want to thank you for joining us today and the best luck to you appreciate it thank you thank you Welcome back, everybody. Uh, for this session, we're going to have two co-hosts. I'm going to have Carrie Estes and Dr. Uh, Clay Zimmerman. I guess we call you co-co-hosts. Uh, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, Carrie, you brought a guest along with you today. Would I you mind did. Her, yes. This is Chastity Penner from DSM for Manish, and she's a technical manager there. Oh, excellent. So, Chastity, um, can you, did I say that right? Did yes. I have too many T's nope, in there? No, nope, that's, that's good, that's good. Um, <laughs> I respond either So, way. yeah, you, you presented, a, uh, you had a poster here today. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of give us an overview of the poster and what the objective of uh, the study was? Yes. So, we have, uh, our poster was looking at um, some of the data that we've compiled over the past year, looking at um, vitamin A recovery levels. Okay. Um, so what we did is we had samples of broiler and broiler breeder premix, vitamin premixes, as well as broiler and broiler breeder feeds. And we looked at vitamin recovery levels um, for those samples. And these are all the samples that we run at our internal lab uh, throughout the past year. So these are ones that's come in from customers. These are ones that have come in from the customers. They've either come from the feed mill um, or uh, they've actually come from, from the bird, from the, from the farms, uh, different scenarios. Um, we run the recovery analysis at our lab. And then what we did is we, so we have this pile of data. Like, okay, what is this data telling us? We do this on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there more that we could get out of this? Um, so what we did is we kind of looked at the numbers. And when we look at vitamin A recovery specifically is what we were looking at. Um, usually we have a threshold of plus or minus 20% recovery as what we consider an acceptable range. So what we did is we looked at those premix sample recoveries and those feed sample recoveries and we looked what percentage of them fell below that acceptable level, so below 80%, which of them were within that acceptable range of 80 to 120%, and which ones were above that, so above 120%. And really the majority of them, a good 50%, 60% were within that acceptable range. Um, and the biggest difference that we saw if we looked between a premix sample and a feed sample is that the averages were about the same and the 
percentage of samples that fell within the acceptable range were the same, but the variation is where we saw the difference. The variation, we saw a much tighter curve, a much tighter bell curve, much smaller standard deviation when we were looking at the pre samples. And that makes sense, you're looking at a much more concentrated sample. Um, then we took a closer look at those feed samples and we kind of categorized them into what we considered a low inclusion rate, so below 10,000 IUs per kilogram of feed, and then a high inclusion level of vitamin A, so above 10,000 IUs uh, per kilogram of uh, inclusion in a finished feed. And then we looked at those same metrics. What's, what's our percentage in the acceptable range? Um, and as we expected, in those higher levels, we did see a higher percentage of samples that were within that acceptable range. And again, we saw with those higher levels, our standard deviation was much smaller, our bell curve was much tighter. And that, that makes sense. Um, when you're looking for vitamins, especially if you're looking at vitamins and feed, you're looking at a needle in a haystack. Um, we're looking at such a small amount, um, but then if we have a higher concentration, we have more needles mm -hmm. in the haystack to find. So we, we, it, it makes sense. And it, it's kind of been a, a rule of thumb that we've always used, plus or minus 20%. But this is the first time we've actually kind of looked into the data and, and looked at those bell curves and, and where the data was lying and what, what additional information we can get out of it. So what's that tell you about uh, the mixing, uh, whether they had a good job or not a good job? Does that tell you anything relative it's to a, that? Uh, for this particular study, it didn't. But if we do have multiple samples, uh, sometimes we can, if we do see a lot of variation beyond what we would see normally um, within a representative sample set, it could tell us if there was some mixing, if the, the premix wasn't mixed adequately enough. Okay. So oh. the, don't fight now. Don't yes. fight. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. So there's a lot of variability, mm -hmm. as you said. So what would you recommend to customers who want to get a like an accurate vitamin A content of their feed or premix? What should they be doing? The best thing you can do is send a representative sample. So I always, with, with anything that when I do analytics, regardless of it, it's vitamins, mycotoxins, making sure you have a representative sample. So what I like to do is I will make composite samples, which are made up of many incremental samples. So I, I look at the lot, wherever, whatever that may be. Um, so a batch of premix that's come in uh, or a, a batch of feed or over several batches. And I will take multiple samples, compile them together into a composite, mix it really well, and then send a representative sample. And I wouldn't, I would suggest sending more than just that one sample as well, because there are gonna be, again, you're looking at such a small amount it's gonna be hard to find that needle in the haystack. So if we have more samples to look at, that'll kind of give you a better idea of, of what the variation is among those different samples. If we're, if we're just looking at one touch point, that doesn't really give you a solid idea of, of is, it, is that 90% true, uh, if that makes sense. So we could have a sample that comes at 80%. Well, is it really, do we lose 20% recovery or is that part of the variation? Right. And we can tell that with the more samples we have. So. I always say, don't send in just one sample, send in as many samples as you can. So is the plus or minus 20%, mm -hmm. is, that, is that the standard for all vitamins or is that specific to vitamin A? I, for, for, I, for me, it's, and I will say I'm not a vitamin expert, I always put that out there. Um, from what I can tell, it's only for vitamin A. Every vitamin has its own analysis um, and has its own um, pros and cons with that analysis. So every it's gonna be different for every vitamin. Like for vitamin E, for example, that's usually considered the gold standard for stability. We tend to see much tighter curves for that, but the same would hold true regardless of the vitamin that you're looking at. If you're looking at a premix versus a feed, your variation is always gonna be less when you're looking at a premix. Uh, it's all a mat it's a factor of um, concentration and dilution. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Willis and Chastity, I want to thank you for joining us today. Of this course, has been yes. a, a very interesting uh, uh, presentation or talk. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, welcome back everyone. I've got uh, Dr. Zach Lohman in the co-pilot seat with me for this session. And our guest uh, is uh, Dr. Valentina Caputi from the USDA. Welcome, glad to have you. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, good. So, uh, you're uh, giving a. Have you given your presentation yet, or is that upcoming? My presentation is actually a poster presentation. Okay. So, I I, I don't have an actual talk to. to I, very well. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell us about your poster then, and what was kind of the objective? What What were you looking to do with that trial? 
So the main, uh, so the main objective of uh, my research is to look uh, for um, alternative to uh, antibiotics to fight the uh, carriage of foodborne pathogens in the poultry industry. So since the withdrawal of antibiotics, the uh, presence of the food pathogens such as uh, Salmonella or Campylobacter has been a, a high burden for the poultry indust industry. So. My specific expertise is the study of the enteric nervous system, which is the nervous system that is uh, intrinsic on the gut wall and is uh, um, distributed throughout the overall uh, gastrointestinal tract. So um, what we are specifically studying in our lab is how um, stress during the uh, pre-harvest stage of the poultry production affects the enteric nervous system, the uh, intestinal microbiota and uh, overall the gut health and how this can predispose the animal to be uh, colonized and to be uh, susceptible to the uh, colonization from the food pathogen such as Salmonella or Campylobacter. And this can uh, like represent a, a novel mechanism to uh, target uh, while uh, to be a target for the industry to um, to treat these animals with alternatives to antibiotic okay. that can enhance the gut health and can prevent the colonization uh, from the food borne pathogens. So one of the um, problem uh, that uh, the poultry industry has is, for example, environmental stress. So yeah. these chickens during the pre-harvest stage are exposed to either cold stress in early life or heat stress in adult life. They are. Uh, they are housed in crowded pens and everything. And then also the climate change is uh, impacting a lot, this increase of temperature. So we are seeing how heat stress alters uh, this uh, um, structure that I am about to talk about in the gut. And now that can predispose the chicken to be more susceptible to be colonized by the food, the food upon pathogens. So in particular on my poster, and, and now this is a new, uh, a, a new uh, thing that I am studying right now that, and is exciting for me. So I am studying uh, the, um, so in the gut we have different uh, barrier levels. So we have the epithelial barrier that is overstudied in all the model and I have seen all the presentation here. And then underneath that we have all a set of neurons that are uh, uh, that belong to the enteric nervous system, immune cells, uh, muscle cells, uh, uh, macrophages, uh, glial cells. So all these cells can represent a second barrier of defense and let's say a second, uh, uh, a second uh, uh, system that can provide and guarantee the health of the gastrointestinal tract and that can be affected by early, by, by stress, mm -hmm. early life stress, heat stress, environmental stress, transportation stress. Yeah. We, we, we are looking about all the different sources of stress that the chickens can have. So in, in particular now I am studying the aquaporin 4 and aquaporin in general. So these are water channels responsible to the, for the exchange of water and fluids okay. between cells and between the tissues. And aquaporin are extensively studied in the brain because they are responsible for the maintenance of the blood brain barrier. And once that is well maintained, it protects from infection that can go to the brain. So I am looking at what happens if stress, if we expose our animals to its stress, for example, and now that affects the uh, expression and the integrity of the aquaporin expressed in the enteric neurons. In the gut, there are different subtypes of aquaporins, but now I am looking at the ones that are expressed in the enteric neurons. And I am seeing that as a, a novel barrier, a second layer of barrier of defense against the foodborne pathogen. So if that barrier is working properly, it can prevent either the bacterial translocation or either the immune activation uh, generated by the interaction of the bacteria with the immune cells of the first barrier of defense. So in my poster, I, so we did this trial, we are doing several trials on heat stress work. So basically uh, I collected uh, intestinal region like cecum and ileum. Yeah. 
and uh, I, uh, I just assessed the expression of uh, aquaporin in neurons and glial cells, which are the main subpopulation of the enteric nervous system, in the heat stressed animals. And we have seen different changes in the aquaporin expressed in the cecum versus the aquaporin expressed in the ileum. So now we have to see how that affects the function of these neurons. And then we want to see how these changes affect the potential impact of colonization of the bird with the Salmonella or Campylobacter. Mm. And that's the next step of the work. And I am happy because we have a really nice and diverse unit. So I am collaborating with my colleagues that are expert in the infection models. Also, we have colleagues expert in vaccine models. So I am, uh, I am looking at this target in all these diff with all these different points of view. Mm. And the, the final objective is, is always to try to see, to formulate new alternative to antibiotics that can preserve this second barrier of defense and they can enhance gut health and prevent, at least in the pre-harvest stage, the colonization with these foodborne pathogens that are a problem for human health yeah. in uh, the end. Very interesting. I'm kind of curious, um, are you just starting with research or if you've gotten far enough along that you've got some practical advice that you can give to producers? Not yet. I am uh, <laughs> quite in the beginning, uh, but uh, I am, uh, because of my background in pharmacology, I am keeping, like, I am uh, like focusing on uh, selecting a target that then can uh, can help me perhaps uh, in designing uh, mm. some uh, molecules or some, uh, we always uh, hear, hear about probiotics or uh, dietary intervention that can yes. help. But I am st still far from there. I just started, but uh, this yeah. is exciting. No, it is exciting <laughs> and, and much needed as, as we well know. Zach, any thoughts you have? Yeah, I was gonna say, so you mentioned you looked at aquaporin 4. There's quite a few. Is that just the main one that's expressed or? So, yes, you're right. There are, uh, I think there are about 11 aquaporin yeah. expressed overall. So they are expressed in the kidney, in the liver, in the epithelium. Mm -hmm. But aquaporin 4 and actually aquaporin 1 are expressed in enteric neurons. There are very, very few papers and also contradictive papers because uh, some papers say that they are expressed mostly in the neurons. Other papers say that they are expressed mostly in glial cells and uh, if they are expressed in the glial cells, that will resemble what happens in the brain. Mm -hmm. Because the enteric glial cells, there are a lot of different types of glial cells in the gut, but they are mostly um, similar to the astrocyte in the brain. We call them enteric astrocytes. So I am doing a lot of staining with different markers to try to understand where is this, uh, uh, where, where are these water channels expressed. I am looking at this specific tool right now. I started with the aquaporin 4 and I am in the process to uh, analyze the aquaporin 1 uh, because they are expressed in the neurons and uh, uh, the neurons are my focus of research. But uh, I think there are other groups that are looking at the other aquaporins in the gastrointestinal tract and it would be nice to uh, analyze everything and yeah. connect everything all together. Yeah. yeah very well. Well, uh, Dr. Caputi, we certainly appreciate the research that you and the USDA is doing on behalf of the industry. I want to thank you for stopping by and spending some time with us uh, here this evening. And thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our last call question is brought to you tonight by Puricol. Look to Puricol choline chloride from Balchem to deliver the highest standards of quality, backed by the strictest process controls, for a level of purity, safety, and consistency you won't find anywhere else. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with uh, Dr. Ken Anderson and soon to be doctor in about a year, uh, Dimitri Maleros uh, from NC State. Um, Ken, would you mind just uh, giving us an overview of your uh, your program there at NC State? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, like I said, I'm Ken Anderson. I've uh, been at North Carolina State for 33 years. And uh, my program is primarily associated with layer management and production. Uh, I work with, I'm the director of the North Carolina Layer Performance and Management Test, which we're hoping to get restarted this fall, uh, which looks at uh, all the production strains in the U.S. And, and then I've also been involved with uh, 
the high path AI situation, looking at depopulation methodologies. So yeah. Would you mind also tell me a little bit about Dimitri? How long has he been working with you? Ooh, uh, <laughs> that, that's a tough question because Dimitri's been uh, kind of grew up in our department. Okay. So, uh, but uh, no, I've known uh, Dimitri since he was an undergraduate uh, and uh, through his master's degree. Um, we worked together on, on that as well. I was on his committee. Um, and then uh, he was interested in working with layers, and I'm always interested in people that want to work with laying hands. So, uh, uh, and we had some projects coming up that he was able to jump into and, yeah, and take off and build from there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dimitri, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about the, uh, uh, the research that you've done there that you're presented here at the uh, uh, poultry science meetings. Definitely. So the research that was presented earlier today, my presentation was earlier today, at, and it was great. Um, we talked about cage densities during the pullet, pullet rearing phase, and we had three treatments, and we really wanted to focus on less, less dense stocking density, where, as other previous studies have done, more stocking density than in the commercial setting. But as consumers have been more focused on animal welfare, um, we wanted to address that and have less stocking density and see if the welfare would be better in those less dense cages. Okay, and what all were you measuring? Uh, we were measuring uh, reg regular production parameters. Production, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we were also measuring blood biochemistry, and then we also did tonic immobility with these chickens. Okay, trying to get a handle on stress level, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Yeah, okay. and the, from the tonic immobility is what we got our fearfulness scores from. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Zach, yeah. Well, I thought the tonic immobility was interesting. I've never uh, actually seen anybody do it before. I saw it pop up and I was like, that's an interesting thing. So do you want them to flip over faster or lay there longer? So the longer they lay there, it means the more fearful they are. Okay. So theoretically, you want them to get up faster. So that means that they're less fearful. Interesting. But we did see that the highest stocking density cages, they were laying there the longest. And we did have a 15 minute cutoff mm -hmm. as from previous studies, they established that 15 minutes is the cutoff. And some chickens did take the full 15 minutes. So that was a lot of fun of watching the chicken lay there for a whole 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Anything that uh, you've learned that uh, you would start implementing on, on uh, in production facilities today? So it is still very early on. This was just the first half of the pullet rearing phase data that we had. We still have a lot more data <clears throat> to collect from the pullet rearing. And we also took these hens out to a full lake cycle to 69 weeks. And we are also collecting a lot of data, the same parameters, to see if there's a carryover effect from the pullet phase into the lay phase. Mm -hmm. So it's too early to draw any conclusions to the industry, but once we have the full picture, yeah. um, we may be able to make some claims. And you'll be working on uh, uh, painting that full picture this coming year? Exactly. Hopefully by IPP time next January, I'll have some more data to present oh. encompassing the lay, the lay and the pullet phase combined. Oh, very well. Yeah. Ken, anything else to add? Uh, no, it's uh, it's been an interesting evolution to, you know, to see how uh, uh, thoughts and, and, and ideas change the direction of a research project. And uh, it's been interesting. I think I think we're going to come up with some interesting findings when we start getting into the, the bone structure and the, uh, you know, and the stress hormones and that type of thing. So, good. So, Dimitri, Ken, thank you for joining us today. To our loyal listeners, it's been a good week. We've met a lot of uh, talented students. We've saw, uh, listened to some great science, and so. Thank you for joining us here once again. Uh, we hope you learned something, hope you had some fun, and hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. 
Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars. Thank you.